Hey, Amy. Hey, Jeff. How are you? Good. Good to be talking with you again. Um, we should introduce ourselves. I'm Jeff Charlotte, uh, contributing editor for Harper's Magazine and author most recently of C Street, The Fundamentalist Threat to American Democracy. And I am Amy Sullivan. I'm a contributor and writer at Time Magazine and uh, author of The Party Faithful about Democrats and religion. And uh, that is actually the first topic we're going to get into today. Um, I will uh, put out there the qualifier for our audience um, that I just gave birth about eight weeks ago. So I have not been following things uh, perhaps as uh, closely as I usually do, but this is a story um, that uh, is close to my heart. Um, so uh, I did notice with the midterm elections that Democrats uh, made uh, even larger losses among certain faith constituencies um, than they did just uh, nationally with voters overall. Um, and uh, one of the post-election debates that's been rising up in some progressive and um, Democratic Party circles is whether Democrats uh, just completely gave up on faith outreach this uh, election cycle as compared to what they did, particularly in the 2006 midterm cycle and 2008. Um, and on the uh, side of people arguing that Democrats didn't do enough are those uh, who point out that the DNC um, has virtually no religion outreach anymore. Um, for decades, they didn't have any, so this is uh, maybe a return to status quo. Um, but briefly, under the Howard Dean era, uh, the DNC put together a faith outreach team, not just one person, uh, as most of the constituencies have, but they had a whole team uh, doing faith outreach to uh, Catholics and to evangelicals, uh, mainline Protestants. Uh, they've always had Jewish outreach and outreach to the black churches, but they really kind of broadened um, that reach and uh, that just simply doesn't exist anymore. There's nothing in the Democratic Party um, structure that's focused on reaching out to religious voters. Uh, the only thing that exists right now is the White House uh, faith office and they're not allowed to do political activity. Um, so uh, there is uh, something to the argument that uh, any structure that had begun to form in 2006 and 2008 um, just simply wasn't in place this time. And so it's um, perhaps not surprising that in addition to losses overall um, in the midterm election, which everybody was expecting, uh, that there were particularly large losses for Democrats among Catholic voters and among white Protestant voters generally. Well, before we get to the losses, let's talk more about um, what happened. This was in place in 2008, not in place in 2010. I know you have been observing and reporting on this uh, for a long time and, and have been an advocate for uh, a, a certain approach. And, and so what happened to, you know, for a while, I think there was folks that you saw doing good work there. Um, uh, what happened to them? Did they just disappear or, or, or why aren't they there anymore? Especially given the fact that you referred to the Howard Dean days, but now we've got Tim Kaine, former governor of Virginia, running the Democratic Party. This is hardly a guy who's allergic to either faith or to using faith as a political tool. Man, who campaigned for governor. I remember there was ads that were, you know, more or less, hi, I'm Tim Kaine. I read the Bible every day. You should vote for me. Uh, <laughs> where did he, why did he veer away from that approach once he uh, was in charge of the Democratic Party? You know, it really is surprising um, because it's hard to imagine that Howard Dean, who's the guy who uh, said during the 2004 primary campaign that he left his church over a dispute over a bike path, um, he was the one who really embraced the importance, uh, as he saw it, uh, for Democrats to engage in Well, he's a man, obviously, who feels his religious passion strong. <laughs> right. He's a schismatic. Yet, you know? It's Tim Kaine who has kind of an ear for this and who did mention often when he was running in 2005, uh, that he had spent time as a missionary in Central America, that his faith was important to him. Um, he was somebody who uh, made sure that that was a narrative that was woven into his campaign commercials. Um, he kind of presided over this era in which uh, Democrats kind of completely dropped uh, their outreach. And again, as I say, that's not surprising for Democrats. Um, for decades, they've just kind of left that uh, ground to uh, the Republican Party. And so that was one of the reasons after 2004 
that a few people uh, who are in the Democratic Party and who are people of faith and had connections with some of those constituencies um, decided that uh, they needed to, uh, in the phrase that my time colleague Michael Duffley uh, came up with, they needed to level the praying field um, and actually uh, stop just seating all of these voters um, to Republicans. Um, there's been a lot of debate about whether that's an appropriate thing uh, for Democrats to do, but uh, I and others have made the argument that uh, at least some of it is just kind of politics 101, that you don't give up um, to the other side uh, a constituency uh, like Catholics, for example, uh, who make up almost a quarter of the electorate. Um, that's a lot of people to just decide um, that they're not going to be your voters and there's not even any point in reaching out to them. Um, well, let's, let me jump in right there, actually, in a sure. second, because that was something, looking over the numbers, um, uh, reading a piece in the Huffington Post that you had pointed me to, I think, by Eric Sapp, who's mm -hmm. been a consultant on these issues. Uh, he said, compared to 2006, Democrats nationally saw a 14% drop in white Protestant support, 14-point drop with white evangelicals, and a whopping 20% decline with Catholics. To which I responded, what do you mean Catholic? Um, you know, it's a, it's a quarter of the uh, uh, the population, but those Catholics are also they're they're they're, they're white, they're they're Latino, they're black, they're uh, they're Asian. Some of them belong to unions. Some of them are in the Northeast. Some are in the West. Uh, I mean, how can we speak of that as a demographic? And is that possibly related to? I mean, what, what I'm wondering is, was the faith outreach in 2008 a little bit? Uh, here was this huge wave that elects Obama, and there's some consultants there and saying, hey, you know, part of the way we did this is because we did this faith outreach to Catholics. Mm -hmm. And and because everyone, the Democrats were happy at that point, no one stopped to say, what do you mean Catholics? Right. Um, how, how, can you, how can you actually do outreach to a group that is as hugely diverse as that? Right. Well, you, you raise a very good point, and it's one of the reasons that I don't think you can use 2008 at all as an election that tells you anything about the so-called Catholic vote. Uh, as you point out, it's very diverse, and I think in 2008, perhaps as in this year, uh, the overriding issue was the economy. Um, so what drove Catholics was not uh, you know, their beliefs influencing their choice, it was economic issues. Um, and in that way, they weren't very different from any other faith constituency. Um, so 2008, I think um, you can't point to that and say, aha, this is the success of Democrats reaching out or the failure of Republicans to connect with Catholics. Um, what is striking to me, I think, is 2006, because that was a year in which um, the Democratic Party overall did not try to do any special outreach to Catholics. And so, in fact, the numbers bumped up a few percentage points um, nationally, but uh, that wasn't really any different from their numbers bumping up among any other demographic groups in which they made gains. Um, there were three states, Ohio, Michigan, and Pennsylvania, um, in which they really went in uh, and organized among uh, lay Catholics. And uh, in some cases, you know, you had a state party chair in Michigan sitting down uh, with religious leaders who had never had a Democrat come and ask to talk to them. Um, and kind of just explaining their position, not saying, you know, we expect you to agree with us on everything or, you know, you can't expect us to agree with you, just actually opening up a dialogue. Um, and strikingly, in those states, uh, Democrats statewide uh, picked up 10 to 15 points among white evangelicals and uh, white Catholics there. Um, so there does seem to be some evidence that uh, that inroads um, was rewarded in those states. And, and that was in 2006, not That was in 2006, absolutely. 2006. Yeah. So that, that, I think, is the more yeah. telling election to point to. 2008 doesn't really tell us much except that the economy matters to people, whether they're well, Catholic well, or nothing. I mean, I think about it in terms of, you know, so how do you appeal? So there's two ways, maybe, that you appeal to faith voters. One, you go and you meet with faith leaders. Um, and that can be, you know... That's a little bit like uh, reporters like to follow endorsements, even though political scientists know that endorsements don't actually make a big difference mm -hmm. in elections. And I think that can be also there's a, the importance of the, the person in the pulpit is sometimes overrated, especially, for instance, in the American Protestant tradition, either mainline or evangelical. Uh, 
which uh, is, is built around you having an individual relationship with God. You respect your pastor, mm -hmm. but that doesn't mean that you necessarily vote the way your pastor does. Uh, exactly. And certainly that's true. It's true in Catholic churches, too. So, so outreach to leaders, that's, a little, that's kind of limited. The other approach is, of course, to talk about faith and values. And I think those terms should always come in, in scare, scare quotes, because what do you mean faith? Faith isn't something you buy by the pound. Um, we saw a couple of elections this year where uh, faith and values uh, really played a big part for Democrats. Uh, one a victory, the other a loss. One was Chris Coons and uh, uh, um, uh, <laughs> Delaware. Delaware uh, right. uh, Christine O'Donnell has uh, loomed so large that she has blanked <laughs> out the name of the state for me. Uh, you know, where we saw this kind of comedic, continual harping on, you know, was she a witch or not? And, mm -hmm. and, and, you know, uh, obviously she was trying to play herself as the Christian right candidate, but what really the, the, the result of that was, um, Chris Coons is a person in the mainstream and Christine O'Donnell is in the religious fringe. And, and, and I argue that that's actually not accurate that she was in the fringe, but that's another story. And then you saw in Kentucky, um, uh, Conway versus Rand Paul, the Democrat there was really playing the religion card right. in a hard and nasty, nasty way, yeah. just the kind of way that Democrats have complained about Republicans doing, mm -hmm. you know, running ads of uh, Buddha uh, because Rand Paul had once had a kind of stupid interaction with something called an aqua Buddha, which wasn't a real Buddhist thing. Uh, and, and, you know, talking about false idols. I mean, when was the last time false idols was an election issue? You know, right. I think it was back around uh, 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 20 B.C. Um, uh, uh, so, you know, the language was there and it didn't work. So the two, the, two, the two ways that you have of appealing, right, talking to the leaders, and that may never have been that big a deal, and, and talking about faith. Mm -hmm. um, and it turns out that that may not be a big deal too. So I'm just wondering, is it really true okay. that Democrats – didn't do this outreach, and it maybe just didn't make a difference. I mean, you look, again, you just go down the list. Brad Ellsworth in uh, Indiana lost badly to, to former Senator Dan Coates, mm -hmm. uh, a man who calls Dan Quayle his mentor. Brad Ellsworth is a guy who, you know, puts faith first and foremost as a kind of conservative, faith-based Democrat, and he got trounced. And I'm wondering if really the case here is that when you try and do religion in the public square, when you try and use religion as a source of authority, um, well folks who favor more authoritarian politics are always going to win. Well, let me uh, push back against you on a, a few different areas there. Um, one is, uh, you know, just to take up Indiana, um, that was a state where I think faith outreach really did make a difference in 2008. Um, you had people from the Obama campaign who spent the whole last month of the election um, in the state meeting people, going into Protestant churches, going into evangelical churches, um, and I think there is some effect of demystifying um, a group that's maybe been demonized, in this case, Democrats and liberals. Um, and it is one of the reasons, I would argue, uh, that Obama ended up winning Indiana, which was the state people didn't think that he was going to take in 2008, um, was some of that work. Uh, because the gains, again, in Indiana in terms of white Catholics and uh, white evangelicals in particular were larger than Obama saw uh, nationwide that year. Um, but just going back to 2006, I think that was the biggest reason to meet with religious leaders, is they would leave these meetings with the state party leader when no Democrat had ever even approached them to try to talk to them before. They thought, you know, there was demonizing going on on both sides. And those leaders weren't necessarily uh, go out and endorse Jennifer Granholm but they also wouldn't preach against her from the pulpit. They wouldn't go tell people it was their Christian duty to vote against Jennifer Granholm. And sometimes that's all it takes to give somebody the leeway to go ahead and cross the aisle if they feel like they want to vote for Jennifer Granholm and it doesn't make them a bad Christian to do so. I would argue I, that, that, that was that's something... Not, I think that, that's suggesting, look, a church that would... First of all, it's illegal to go in the pulpit and say... Don't vote for Jennifer Granholm, right? You don't but have of to course, we know the, the preachers do it. For it to be we know, clear. Yeah, yes. we know it happens, yeah. right? But a church that has gone that far, you know, that is willing to say that, where the preacher saying that in the pulpit, where that's part of it, um, you're not going to that church if you're kind of on the fence. Uh, well, you already I, know where you're at. It's 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 other churches where they're not talking about politics very often. I don't know. Those I, are mainline and evangelical churches where where just the you know politics are not part of the meat and potatoes of the sermon. Those are the churches where you're going to get undecided voters. 
Uh, but I, I have a hard time, you know, imagining, uh, 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 you know, a very conservative megachurch pastor who's been uh, screaming and breaking the law, screaming about Democrats for a long time. This time he sits it out and everyone says, hey, you know, I think I'll forget my convictions of the last 20 years and, and, and switch and go across the aisle. Well, I'll just say I was a member of a Baptist church and happily a member uh, where the pastor would say that you can be a good Christian and be a Democrat. Um, and that did influence good people in the church who otherwise, uh, I think, would have uh, been more likely to follow their consciences and, and, and just follow their own uh, interests, maybe, in terms of how they were voting. Uh, but but that's exactly thing, what I mean. A church with a pastor like that is filled with people who are going to be willing to consider other things, you know, uh, you, you weren't going to, uh, uh, it sounds like, you know, from what I know, you grew up in sort of the old Southern Baptist, uh, you're Southern Baptist, right? Uh, it was American Baptist, actually. Oh, American so, Baptist, Paul um, um, and, and, you know, as you know, even more liberal than the old Southern Baptist, um, uh, convention, which was liberal, but it was moderate. Um, uh, you know, that church is already filled with people. If you're in that church, if you're an American Baptist church, as opposed to a Southern Baptist church, you've already made the choice to uh, to not entrench yourself in a, in a certain kind of politics. Um, uh, so I wonder how much, how much really change is happening there. Well, we're going to agree to disagree on that, but let me just move on to two quick other points. Yeah. One is... Uh, in terms of the type of outreach, in addition to meeting with religious leaders, one of the things Democrats had done in 2006 and 2008 is just realize that uh, there were issues um, where they could find some common ground with, to take one group, uh, say white Catholics. Uh, the idea that um, professional Democrats had just written off that entire constituency for years because they thought abortion was the only issue that mattered to white Catholic voters uh, was really short-sighted. But um, that's not just, that's just not true. What Democrats had, Democrats had written off Boston for years. <laughs> I mean, uh, white Catholics have other interests besides abortion and always have. And, and, you know, you know, the great shifts of, uh, of the Reagan years was white Catholics started voting for Republicans, but they were always a very natural democratic constituency. Well, Jeff, in 1988, the Dukakis campaign made a decision not to have their candidate appear at any Catholic institution because they were concerned about protests uh, over abortion, they were concerned that Dukakis would get questions about abortion. So that's a problem. The Kerry campaign made very similar decisions in 2004. Uh, Kerry was actually invited to speak at John Carroll University, a Catholic school in Ohio, which, as we know, turned out to be a key state um, in 2004, and the staff uh, wouldn't let him speak there, and he was uh, advised not to uh, because they thought that he would get questions about abortion, that would be it. What would have happened is that the local bishop who had agreed to appear on stage uh, with Kerry would have been seen not endorsing Kerry, but at least, again, indicating that he wasn't a bad Catholic, that this was somebody who the local bishop was willing to share a stage with. And I think for some Catholics um, in Ohio, that may have made a difference. Um, but there is one Catholic uh, politician this year um, who did kind of buck the trend as well by doing almost the only faith outreach that happened among Democrats. Um, and that's Tom Cariello in Virginia, who ended up losing. Um, but he was one of the few Democratic candidates who really kept talking about his faith the whole time and kept putting issues like the economy um, and losing jobs into uh, kind of social justice language and using that in terms of his outreach. And although he ended up losing his seat, uh, he came much closer than other Democrats who maybe won those seats in 2006 and 2008 that Democrats uh, were never going to hold on to because they weren't really uh, naturally their seats. Um, and some of that's because he just was willing to stand on principle where other people weren't. Uh, but I think part of that principle is driven by his faith and his uh, just insistence on being authentic about his faith instead of just pulling it out uh, when it seems like a campaign word of work. Well, I, you know, I, I, I'm going to disagree with you there. So certainly, I mean, we already talked about it. He's not the only Democrat who did this. Uh, Jack Conway did it in Kentucky with a, a really yeah, ugly positive. fashion and lost. Brad Ellsworth did it in Indiana and in a kind of respectable uh, conservative Catholic Democratic. Right, but outreach is and not he also talking lost. about faith. 
Sorry? Oh, outreach is not just churches. talking I think those about guys it. were campaigning in churches. I mean, there's a lot of Democrats who are campaigning in churches. And, and Well, they always go to black churches, but that's not the type of outreach that was being done in 2006 and 2008, which started uh, to lead to larger pickups. It, it, exactly. But nonetheless, people were doing this kind of, of rhetoric. And I, I think, you know, one of the things that you see happening is you keep on... It, it, it was you just use the word authentic and, and it was a word that I picked out I'm going to quote it uh, from again from Eric Sapp because he's one of the you know the consultants who has been talking a lot about this in his article about it. he says Democrats did faith work I'm quoting Democrats did faith work differently than the Republicans had in the past focusing on authenticity of narrative and humility and how they brought faith into the public square now you know me I'm a pretty liberal guy but that almost makes me want to vote for a Republican because that's so smug oh see the difference between our uh, faith outreach and Republican outreach is, is ours was real and humble. Well, you know, Republicans feel that theirs is real and humble too. Um, and I think what that's sort of ignoring is that they're, they're, they're kind of, it didn't, you know, you talked about leveling the praying field, but what happened is what's happened with Democrats and faith outreach is that they've, they haven't leveled the praying field, they've just gone over onto the Republicans' praying field, and they're doing it in Republican terms. And they're doing it and saying, you know, the, the implicit message uh, that's played out again and again is vote for me because I'm a Christian. That's really what a lot of these guys ended up doing. They're not going to say it quite that plainly. Uh, Jack Conway kind of did. But um, again, that kind of outreach doesn't work. And that's not what happened in 2006. Well, it does. And, and it, works for, Republic, it works for Republicans, you know, in, in, in case. Because that's their constituency. Because it, it doesn't necessarily work in vote for me, I'm a Christian. It works in you can't vote for that other guy. He's not a Christian. He's not a oh, real that's a good Christian. Distinction. Yeah. Um, and I think that there is a difference there. And again, somebody like Periello isn't out there trying to win by suggesting that his opponent isn't a real Christian. He's, he absolutely is. And I admire that guy. I, I'm sorry that he lost. But he absolutely is. And I think that's you have to recognize that what feels authentic and humble to you, if you're on the other, you know, that, that statement of the authenticity and humility of the democratic narrative is only because the Republican narrative doesn't seem authentic and humble to Democrats. But it's, it's expressed like that. You know, a lot of those Republicans were out there, um, you know, I think of some of the guys I've really talked to a lot or studied, you know, guys like Senator Tom Coburn or, 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 or Sam Brownback, who's moved up to the governor of, a, of Kansas and so on. They really feel that it's authentic. They feel like they're just talking about something personal. They feel like they're not trying to challenge another person's faith. But that's the thing. And if the other person doesn't want to talk about their faith background, whether because it's personal or because maybe it doesn't, it's not going to, you know, it's not something widely shared or something like that. If you just say, you know, I, I'm not going to talk about the other guy. I'm just going to talk about my humble love of God. Well, what's, the, what's, the, what's that left for the other person to do? And that's what I say, that they've gone over onto the Republican praying field. You know, there's no, there is no kind of really small D democratic way to do that. You're saying, I think one of the criteria here should be uh, your relationship with God and in particular with a Christian God. Well, we should probably move on to another topic, but I will say, you know, we do agree on the fact that Republicans can absolutely be authentic about this. They can also be very uh, crass in terms of uh, knowing that there are uh, constituencies they can turn out easily. Democrats can do exactly the same thing. Uh, but I think, uh, for me, the difference in terms of how you and I see this is that uh, just for decades, it was something Democrats were very hesitant to talk about. A, because they thought that it was inappropriate um, for them to speak about that part of who they are. John Kerry used to say, you know, I'm a Democrat and I'm a U.S. Senator, and the two things aren't related. And that's simply not how people of faith think about their faith. It's not something they check at the door. Oh, oh go I got to the office. People of faith, that's not how people of faith think about their faith. We've got about 84, 85% of America lives in God. What do you mean, people of how people of faith think about faith? And this is, this is what bothers me about the democratic outreach to people of faith. It's really crushing this wild, beautiful kind of 
bizarre tapestry, the varieties of religious experience in America into, you know, people of faith, POF. Uh, faith yeah, is you know we very well, I was just using that as shorthand to try to get into another point that didn't have to do with well, trying to I don't to think we can use it as shorthand. I mean, I think that's something we really got to focus on. I think that's... All right. It, well, Democrats Carrie want to said talk. that because some Muslims and some Jews and some Methodists and some Lutherans and some Sikhs and some Buddhists don't separate out their beliefs in terms of who they are as religious people from the rest of their identity. And so that is one of the things that they see as uh, kind of false when somebody tells them that their religious identity has nothing to do with who they are in the rest of their lives. That's just something that automatically kind of rings uh, a bell for them or raises a red flag that this person is probably faking their faith when they talk about it because it seems like that's not true. But well, I, think, I think we should. I think we're both pushing topic. each other into defending things we wouldn't want to defend. I've pushed you into defending people's faith, and now you're pushing me into defending John Kerry, which I really don't want to defend. You're right, absolutely. That kind of statement is ridiculous and absurd. But let's let's take it. You know, let's take it to Oklahoma, where uh, people of faith of all sorts. Um, uh, uh, responded to a narrative that they felt was authentic, um, uh, but it's probably pretty troubling to most, uh, which was that the people of Oklahoma voted, I think, um, by 70 to percent to 30 to outlaw the use of Sharia law and court decisions. Because, you know, Oklahoma judges were just going crazy uh, imposing Sharia law. So someone just drew a line in the stand. Uh, sand and said it had to stop. And that someone, by the way, I mean, this had some pretty prominent uh, support. James Woolsey, former director of the CIA, uh, really came out swinging on this issue and, and supporting them uh, and talking about the danger of Sharia law taking over America. Um, since that happened, a judge has already put a block on the implement of this, uh, of this piece of, uh, I guess, the referendum. Um, but you know, the issue has been introduced. You know, what would seem like a kind of a fringe idea has now become state law in one state. And uh, the question is, is, it, is this an aberration or do we think that this might have legs? Yeah, well, it is troubling. And even the, um, you know, discussing the fact of a judge putting a block on it, um, it implies that, uh, you know, this was actually a problem. And so now people can continue going on using sugar law. Um, you know, as we know that, just doesn't happen, uh, not just uh, in Oklahoma courtrooms, but uh, you really can't find anywhere in any courtroom in America um, where this has even begun to be an issue. Uh, it was something that Sharon Engel raised as well in her Senate campaign, which uh, we will just note um, didn't work out all that well for her. And it was really interesting to me to see she had singled out uh, Dearborn, Michigan, which is uh, close to my hometown. Um, as one of the uh, places in the U.S. where this is in danger of completely taking over. Um, and we know Dearborn is uh, where the largest population of Arabs um, in the U.S. lives. Um, and the mayor of Dearborn uh, wrote her an uh, open letter, um, kind of really harshly taking her to task and saying, for one thing, um, it, it's ignorant to refer to Arabs as uh, all Muslims. Dearborn has a, a huge... Uh, population of Chaldean Christians, um, and it's a very diverse community. Um, but secondly, uh, Arabs have been in Dearborn for about a hundred years now. Henry Ford um, really uh, courted uh, them as cheap workers for some of his first plants in the Detroit area. Um, and so if they're trying to uh, take over with uh, Sharia law, they're doing a really poor job of it because it's been a hundred years. Um, it hasn't really taken yet. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, the, the other interesting thing about this is the sort of the kind of uh, solidification of Sharia law as something that we have to worry about. And what's interesting to me about this is sort of the mainstream is when you have that extreme statements like Sharon Angle or the Oklahoma law, um, uh, that puts, uh, I would argue that we're both a little saner than that, that puts sane people like us in the position of saying, well, Sharia law uh, isn't even... Uh, isn't even close to happening. And there's a little kind of strange little victory that happens with bigotry there because when we say, well, Sharia law is not even close to happening, we're almost sort of agreeing with their terms that Sharia law is this kind of horrific, barbaric thing that one wouldn't have, want to happen, but it, it isn't happening anyway. 
when, you know, the reality is Sharia law, first of all, it's commonly misrepresented not just by Sharon Angle, but by mainstream media organizations. It's not Islamic law. Right. This is not what the Quran says. Sharia law is very specifically, a, it's the most sort of living document of law you can find. It's the human attempt to interpret God's will. Now, that's not appropriate in a d democracy with separation of church or mosque and state. But nonetheless, it's not this fixed, rigid uh, thing that's been represented as in, in, in some more traditionally matriarchal Muslim societies. You see Sharia law uh, with much more equitable uh, um, uh, divisions of gender between men and women. I mean, it's a changing, it's a changing body of law. Now, I'm not saying that we say, well, then why don't bring it on? Uh, I'm saying that the the rhetorical moves of the right are are dragging the whole conversation into this bigoted place um, where it's hard for us to even separate ourselves out from uh, their hate speech. Yeah, you're right. And it, it is dangerous because it would be, as you said, more appropriate for us to say that, uh, you know, religiously based laws are not uh, in place in America. And uh, to point out that, in fact, there are groups of conservative Christians who wish they were who they would argue that uh, U.S. law should be based on uh, Christian principles. Um, and in fact, they and, would and a lot of them won election. <laughs> yes. <laughs> a couple weeks ago. So, yeah. Um, and um, they would argue, well, they think we're a Christian country, so that would be appropriate. But because we're not a majority Muslim country, the Sharia law wouldn't be appropriate. Um, but you're right that it's uh, kind of a dangerous um ground that it gets us into. And I wonder if this is similar to uh, the one Williams statement of a few weeks back, um, mm. just in terms of the very broad way in which people are comfortable um, not only talking about Muslims as one um, type that we should be afraid of, uh, but also um, conflating um, all sorts of uh, religious expression with some sort of uh, dangerous political idea. Yeah, yeah. Well, that's an interesting point, and, and maybe that gives us a segue to another subject. I know we were going to talk about Glenn Beck, but that, that conflation of religion with the political idea. Uh, we had on our list of things we wanted to talk about today some news coming out of the U.S. Air Force Academy. Mm -hmm. It reminded me that uh, I spent some time out there uh, uh, a few years ago uh, researching sort of what's going on with, with religious politics in the military uh, for my book, Sea Street. And and what amazed me was that uh, across the political spectrum and across the religious spectrum of cadets there, I kept on encountering this idea that Islam is not actually a religious idea. It's a political idea. And this wasn't just coming from, you know, anti-Muslim Christian fundamentalists. This was coming from the liberal cadets who said, well, um, but Islam, we've been, you know, we've been taught is not actually a religious system. It's a political system. And you, you think you see that idea kind of kind of moving around on the conservative side of things, and so you see why they see you know well the comparison of Sharia law and it's, uh, is not relevant to our idea that this is a Christian nation. The more apt comparison of Sharia law would be to communism, a, a political system, an ideological system, mm -hmm. um, uh, and I think that you know that that goes beyond sort of bigotry, but into sort of a, a whole paradigm shift. Mm -hmm of how we talk about people uh, who might believe other by, other than us. Mm -hmm. Well, where did that come from? Because we've also heard that this year raised um, in terms of the suggestion that uh, Muslims don't uh, deserve protection under the First Amendment. Um, That's that right. Who was that? The Lieutenant Governor of Tennessee. Yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and you had on a list of things we should talk about, too, a, a, mosque, uh, a mosque issue in Tennessee. Will you... Tell us more about that. Yeah, well, it's very similar um, to what you just said. Uh, you know, they've been holding a hearing um, because this mosque, um, and I'm going to get this wrong, but I think it's Murfreesboro, Tennessee. Oh, I think you're right. Yeah, that's it. Um, they had been granted an okay uh, by the city council, or I believe, um, to build a mosque. Um, and so some angry citizens uh, have, um, I guess, appealed that decision um, and so there's this uh, kind of trial of a sort um, taking place right now. Um, and one of the arguments is that this isn't a legitimate uh, religion. Um, but mostly uh, the trial appears to be a way uh, to just throw out a whole heck of a lot of anti-Muslim um, rumors and stereotypes and conspiracies. 
um, and the guy who's running it um, is uh, not putting a lid on that at all. So it's um, certainly not something where the emotions had died down, um, but uh, this is stirring them up even further than they had been before. Um, and considering that it seems like uh, the building in the mosque is going to continue, um, that's just not uh, good news in terms of what the, um, what the community uh, fever is going to be like, uh, which isn't at all a reason not to build it, um, just seems uh, inappropriate in terms of public officials uh, who maybe should be looking for uh, a way to tamp down the emotions instead of uh, whipping them up. Well, yeah. Speaking of uh, you know the fever rising, so let's let's bring it back then to Glen the Air Force. Um, oh, we'll go come. Now, now we're on the fever. Now the, 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 the fever is rising. We're reaching the boiling point, and I, I feel like we've got the segue here because the question always yeah. becomes, and this is the question that we're, you know, you and I are discussing. People are discussing for a long time. You know, are we reaching this boiling point in American politics? And uh, you know, one of the. Uh, where we have things, you know, we have bigotry passing over from fringe into, uh, you know, law in places like Oklahoma or, or uh, mainstream candidacies, as Sharon Engel's candidacy did become, uh, um, or, or certainly, you know, uh, a state like Tennessee um, just feeling like it's fine to go ahead with this kind of, uh, you know, there's no pressure from the state to saying, hey, you know, We've got to protect all our citizens here. And and are we reaching a boiling point? And, and I'm, uh, with Glenn Beck, I'm referring to uh, this is, a, you know, I had actually missed this, and you drew my attention to it. Um, I'm just looking at my notes here on that. Uh, and Glenn Beck did a two part series on George Soros, the, the billionaire financier who funds a lot of liberal uh, causes, the Open Society Institute. The series was called The Puppet Master. And uh, it begins with a sort of, uh, I mean, it, it, Begins with footage. It looks like you know, Gerbil shot it. Yeah. George Soros's face in grainy black and white and old timey kind of 1930s film stock of a of a, a, a puppet's drawstrings being pulled. The puppet master George Soros, who he describes as Jewish, but he's not Jewish enough for Glenn Beck. He's not the right kind of Jew. He was a Jew, but now he's an atheist. Glenn Beck does not seem to understand that you're Jewish, whether or not you're yeah. to shul. Um, but that more importantly, that he's a that, that he's a puppet master who controls banking, who destroys economies, has destroyed economies all over the world. Next is us, um, uh, and really kind of invokes every cliche of classic yeah. anti-Semitism. Yeah. And you know, I'll just and let me just give us one quote, and then we can talk about it. This comes from J.J. Goldberg, who's a, a longtime editor of the Forward, the, the Jewish Forward. And J.J. Goldberg's really one of the, the most reliable and perceptive observers of Jewish political life uh, and, and uh, in America, very, very fair-minded, very, very balanced. He says, there's a difference between uh, first-degree murder and vehicular homicide, which is intentionality. Uh, uh, he says he's not convinced that Beck meant to attack the Jews. Nevertheless, he described the show as as close as I've heard to mainstream tele on mainstream television to fascism. Uh, this is not a guy who is you know, prone to using that language. And uh, is this a boiling point? Are, are we, do we set the stage with this, these midterm elections for uh, a boiling point? Or is this um, uh, just a simmer? You know, it's a really good question. And it's something I've been thinking about a lot uh, because, you know, we're always reminded of how short our memories are. Um, and so I've been, uh, you know, thinking and reading about the know-nothings um, yeah. going after Catholics and, uh, you know, how in 1960 uh, people were um, trying to convince um, themselves and others that if Kennedy were elected that, uh, you know, similar to the Sharia um, concern that we would somehow be under Catholic law, that the Pope would be directing uh, the president and uh, approving all decisions. Um, so this is not new, but there is something knew about it. Um, and I guess I'm trying to figure out uh, the, the previous um, levels of uh, fear and um, demagoguery um, simmered down at some point. Um, but is that possible to happen uh, with the That's type it. of media that we have now? I just don't know. It, it's really... I think um, you really put your finger on question. right there. Do we even have, do we have the institutional framework to cool it down. Hmm. Um, 
Well, we probably do have the institutional framework to cool it down. The question is, um, can it happen? Um, you know, one of the things that was um, disturbing, I found, in the debate over the, uh, the what, Park 51 Center, uh, which was called the Ground Zero Mosque, um, which we seem to have uh, moved on from uh, very quickly. It probably served its purpose of scaring people, and now we can go on to the next thing, um, was how quickly uh, mainstream Democrats felt the need uh, to weigh in and assure people that they in no way um, were on the side of scary Muslims. Um, and, uh, you know, unless you have people who stand to lose something, who are willing to stand up and actually be the voice of sanity and reason, um, it's going to be very hard to use the infrastructure that could push back against other voices uh, within the media and within the political sphere um, to try to simmer things down. I mean, we, we have the means to do it. What we need are the people who are willing to push back. Um, and we haven't seen a lot of that. Yeah. Yeah. I don't, I, I guess I would question whether we have the means to do it even. Uh, I mean, it, leaving aside the know nothings, which is really far back, um, but just the, the Kennedy moment, uh, the Kennedy debate, we still had a very consensus driven media then. And I'm glad to see that gone. Uh, uh, I'm one of these people who, who, who likes all this sort of these ridiculous little fragmentation of media. I think that's great. I think that brings us back to, you know, the early sort of Republican, small R Republican model of, pre of the press in American life, um, you know, way back in, in you know, the, the early days. Um, uh, but, you know, there's no Walter Cronkite to come in and put the kibosh on this language. Um, and so that's fine. That, then it's up to us. It's up to us as sort of a, a, as, a, as a small D democratic crowd. And, and I don't see that happening. So I think what, you know, I think you're right to point out that uh, it's you got to be very wary about saying, you know, um, is this a boiling point? We've got to remember history. And that's something you and I have talked a lot about is that, that, you know, most of these things that people get afraid of, in fact, have happened many times before in American life. But something does feel new about this hate. Um, which is, uh, it's just got a more, maybe a more liquid form, maybe it's, it's a little more agile, um, it's a little less rooted in a pre-existing constituency, it's, it's, it's a newly forming hate rather than an old hate coming up. Uh, and I think that, you know, just that language that saying that Islam is a religion, uh, is, is an ideology, not a religion. Mm -hmm. That's kind of an interesting, that's an interesting move. That's not coming out of, uh, you know, well, my grandpappy, taught me that Islam is a, is an ideology, not a religion. That's innovation. Um, that's hate coming up as a, as a new thing, as an innovative thing. Um, and, and it's I, frankly being willing to believe an email you get from maybe somebody, you know, but originally written by a complete stranger, um, over, uh, maybe even your instincts. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, it, it's, the thing, though, that we, we, we tend to make fun of people who, who believe emails that they get from strangers. Um, uh, but we forget that, you know, the transmission of information and knowledge usually takes place in such a fashion that by the time it reaches us, it doesn't actually feel like a stranger. Mm -hmm. I mean, you know, uh, um, you take uh, an example of, uh, what's her name, Pamela Geller? Uh, yes. You know, um, the, the, the prominent uh, anti-Islamic uh, uh, activist. And you know, people, uh, they think they know her. She's able to create a, a real intimacy with her media. I mean, you know, real intimacy. You know, remember her first anti-Muslim uh, anti screeds were, were, were filmed with her sort of bobbing in the water in a bikini. Uh, um, uh, so you sort of thought, well, this is a, here's Pamela, my friend. Um, uh, or if you're an ogler, here's Pamela, this, you know, this hot chick who's saying all the, the same hateful things that I feel. How awesome is that? Um, uh, and... And so, it, you know, it's not that people are being duped um, by, they're being more willing to believe strangers. It's that we have fewer strangers. Um, that, that, that is maybe what sort of, I feel like, is sort of the breakdown of the institutional framework. And that seems like a good thing, is that, that we can sort of talk to each other, not as strangers, but in this more intimate, direct way. Um, but I think we're going to have to develop, uh, uh, develop new approaches to fighting back against these bigotries, because there is, there is no... There is no big daddy Cronkite to come in and, and, and put a stop to it anymore, and there shouldn't be. Right. Well, um, 
you know, maybe to give us a hopeful note to close on, uh, you know, if we're in a world of fragmentation, which it seems like we are, and there's no going back from it, whether you like it or not, um, it does kind of uh, raise the importance of uh, what has always been the closest influence to people, which is their immediate community. Um, and I know in Michigan, uh, there's been a lot of work in terms of uh, interfaith dialogue, and some of the outcome of that has been some pastors who might not otherwise have made this an interest of theirs at all um, in getting to meet Muslim leaders and then returning to their own churches. And these are folks who may be getting these emails, um, but if their pastor is uh, initiating conversations with them um, and being willing to talk about Muslims as people um, who are religious believers in their own right, even if they believe something else, um, that's the kind of more positive conversation that could take place. Now, it requires um, uh, pastors and other religious leaders um, to themselves believe uh, that uh, Muslims are not all uh, terrorists who are looking for any excuse to turn around and kill you. Um, but uh, because I think there are more rational religious leaders than not, um, although I know people can always argue with that, um, it seems like that might be a possible way to have conversations within communities uh, that maybe aren't taking place yet. Yeah. And wouldn't be in the public school, which is, I think, where people's um, instinct is to jump to. Well, we'll just teach tolerance um, through the public school. We'll teach everybody that Muslims are, are good people. Um, and, uh, you know, that's all well and good. Uh, but that gets people all riled up in issues about public education. And, and it doesn't very work work very well because you're trying no. to teach. I mean, schools are, look, uh, you know, I've got a little daughter and, and so do you, and they're going to go out to school. Schools are necessarily authoritarian structures. You, you do what the teacher says. Yeah. teacher might give you some leeway. And these conversations have to happen in a more freewheeling space, yeah. a space where uh, bigots are going to feel free to express their bigot, bigotry and um and have that engaged. And so that's not, a, that's not a thing for a school. We can't voice that off on our kids. That's a conversation that, yeah, that adults need to have. Right. You're absolutely right. Well, there's a happy note. We worked our way around <laughs> to a, a ha happy note to end Excellent. on. Excellent. Uh, uh, it's great talking to you as, as always, Amy, and congratulations again on, on the newborn. Thank you. I hear the poor little girl screaming downstairs with her Abba, so I think I need to go rescue him. But uh, this has been a pleasure, and it's been uh, especially good to talk about something other than Dr. Seuss for an hour. So thank you, Jeff. Let's do this Great. again. Take care, Amy. Bye-bye. Okay, you too.